Good morning, church. This morning, it's Jeremiah chapter 19. Every once in a while, I like to read up on persecution. There's several websites that you can go to that have up-to-date information of what's happening in the world. And it helps us to, or helps me to, I guess, not become quite as comfortable realizing that we're living in a place where there's, well, we have quite a bit of peace when it comes to persecution. We don't, we're not really being persecuted at all in this country. And, um, but yet it's not like that in many parts of the world. Last uh, month, which would be October 13th, uh, in Uganda, a pastor and his family were attacked in their house and they were killed. The pastor, his wife, and their four-year-old, four-year-old uh, daughter named Sylvia and their seven-year-old named Judith. Um, and this is something that for us, you know, it's foreign, but yet it's not so foreign in some countries. Also, uh, last month, October 9th, a husband poured acid on his wife. Uh, she was a Muslim and she converted in August of this year. She converted to Christianity. Her husband wasn't happy about it. And on October 9th, he poured battery acid on her and uh, causing severe burns. And she's today still recovering, requiring restructive surgery. Um, but persecution because, well, just because of one reason. Because they love Jesus and they've converted to Christianity. On October 10th, also of last month, four Christians were killed in Nigeria in the county of Bokus, and five others were wounded. This year alone in Bokus County of Nigeria, over 100 Christians have lost their life because they are believers. That's happening, you know, continually. People are dying because they are Christians. And I think as Christians, we can get complacent. We can become soft. And we can become soft towards the world and start meddling with the world a little bit because we become soft Christians, become weak Christians. It's kind of like when you sit in the office all day, you become really soft. But when you're outside, you're working hard and you're active, you become a little bit more buff, a little bit more solid. And Christians who are being persecuted, I think they are oftentimes a little bit more solid. They're a little bit more purified. They're, they are a little bit more separated from the world because they realize that it's only either where you're, you, you stick with Jesus and you live for him or you, you go back to the world. There's not that in-between place. But persecution never kills the church. We see that through history. Persecution really grows the church. It's the seed of the church. Tertullian, uh, who was observing the persecution in the Roman Empire, he said these famous words, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And I believe that is true. We see that the persecution throughout centuries has not extinguished the church. Now, Jeremiah is called to prophesy and to warn Judah because they have become complacent. Things are going well. We're doing well. We have enough to eat. There's peace in the land. And they start dabbling with the world. They start a little bit of idolatry and they get involved more and more until they have basically completely turned their faces on God and they're now living full-fledged in the world. And Jeremiah, a believer, now is being persecuted by his own people. That's, in other words, a Christian being persecuted by Christians. <laughs> that's kind of, you know, that's kind of how it is. He was in a Christian land, Israel, and yet that's where he was being persecuted. Well, God sends Jeremiah to preach, and his sermons are action sermons. They're more memorable that way. I have read that you 
remember about 10%, maybe maximum 20% of what you hear, but you remember about 50% if you hear and see. So God says, hey, we got to make sure these people remember. So go to them and preach to them so they hear, but also an object lesson. Each time he tells them to do something. This time he tells them to take a pot. Last chapter, he told them to go and observe as a pot was made. And now he says, okay, now, Jeremiah, go get a pot and let's do a sermon. Verse 1, thus says the Lord, chapter 19, go and get a potter's earthen flask and take some of the elders of the people and some of the elders of the priests and go out to the valley of the son of Hinnom, which is by the entry of the potsherd gate, and proclaim there the words that I will tell you. So he's, going, he's asked to go to the dung gate where all the garbage is taken out and then go to the valley of Hinnom, the garbage pit, and uh, take some of the important people with you, the elders, the, the community elders of Jerusalem, take them with you, verse 3, and say, hear the word of the Lord, O king of Judah, inhabitants of Jerusalem. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, behold, I will bring such a catastrophe on this place that whoever hears of it his ears will tingle because they have forsaken me and made this an alien place because they have burned incense in it to other gods whom neither they nor their fathers nor the kings of Judah have known. And they have fa filled this place with the blood of the innocents. They have also built the high places of Baal to burn their sons with fire for burnt offerings to Baal, which I did not command or speak, nor did it come to my mind. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that this place shall no more be called to fat or the valley of the sin of Hinnom, but the valley of slaughter. And I will make void the council of Judah and Jerusalem in this place, and I will cause them to fall by the sword before their enemies and by the hands of those who seek their lives. Their corpses I will give as meat for the birds of heaven and for the beasts of the earth. So go through the dung gate, and go down to the valley of Tophat, which means, Tophat means the fire pit. It's the place where they dumped their garbage. And it was always smoldering and it was burning. The, the potters would go and throw their unwanted pots in this area. In Revelation, this Tophat is also called the lake of fire. It's where we get the word hell from. It comes from this place. So now go stand in that place with a pot and preach to the people, the elders. Give them an object lesson, verse 10. Then you shall break the flask in the sight of the men who go with you and say to them, thus says the Lord of hosts, even so I will break this people in this city as one breaks a potter's vessel, which cannot be made whole again. And they shall bury them in Tophet till there is no place to bury. Thus I will do this place, thus I will do to this place, says the Lord, and to its inhabitants, and make this city like Tophet. And the houses of Jerusalem and the houses of the kings of Judah shall be defiled like the place of Tophet, because of all the houses on whose roofs they have burnt incense to all the hosts of heaven and poured out drink offerings to other gods. So he now stands and he overlooks this dump with these men and he breaks the pot in his hand and then he gives a message. This is what God is going to do to Jerusalem because you sacrifice your children in this place. You sacrifice your children to Moak and you worship other gods. Now, can you imagine worshiping Moak in a garbage pit? I guess that's probably the best place where you can worship him if you want, right? <laughs> the garbage pit. But the impact of this message, a broken, useless pot overlooking a garbage pit with fire and worms. This is the result of going this direction in your life. And isn't it the same today? That when someone, God has not intended for all of us to be this beautiful pot. God is the potter, we are the clay. And God wants to shape us into a useful pot that he can use us to carry his wine, to carry his message, 
to other people throughout the world. God needs a flask. He needs a pot to carry out the message, to, to carry out new wine. And new wines, can, as Jesus said, he wants to use you. But when we rebel, like Judah did, we become hardened. You remember what Jesus said in the Old Testament or New Testament? He said, new wine cannot be stored in old wineskins. Why? Because old wineskins become hard and brittle. If you pour new wine in old wineskins, what happens? The new wines begins to ferment. It, it, it causes pressure. And the old wineskins break because they're not flexible. So Jesus said you need to pour new wine in new wineskins so that they are flexible. This is what happens oftentimes in the church, in the body of Christ as a whole, is that as a church, we become hard. We become unmoldable. We become, new, we become unshapeable. Uh, we cannot, this is how we have it, and we can't change. This is just the way it is. And we become, we put, and the more we become like that, the more rules we need to implement. And eventually the Holy Spirit is kind of pushed to the side and we are just a bunch of people following a bunch of rules blindly. And if anyone challenges them, we have to put them aside so that we can continue. We become unmoldable, unshapeable. Now the word of God never changes. We should always follow the word of God. But the Holy Spirit desires a live church, a church that's alive, a church that, that is active, that impacts lives and changes lives so we have to be shapeable and moldable now israel had become like a pot it was hardened after the pot has been formed by the potter the clay it's put in a kiln and it's dried after that you can't do anything with a pot it's just it's dry it cannot be moldable jesus wants to mold us and to shape us to form us and when we turn away from god when we go to sin when we go and we dabble with the world a little bit we become a little bit hard. We become a little bit calloused in the hands of God. And God can't use us the way he wants to. And sometimes God has to break us. Break us so that we come back to him. And that's essentially what he's doing to Judah. He wants to break them. Not because he wants to, but he has to. In order to bring them back again into the land. And this time they will be moldable. In verse 14. Then Jeremiah came from Tophat, where the Lord had sent him to prophesy. And he stood in the court of the Lord's house and said to all the people, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will bring in this city and all her towns and all the doom that I have pronounced against it, because they have stiffened their necks and they might not hear my words. And then we come to chapter 20. In verse 1, Now Peshur, the son of Immer, the priest who was also governor in the house of the Lord heard that Jeremiah prophesied these things. And then Peshur struck Jeremiah the prophet and put him in stocks that were in the high gate into Benjamin, which was by the house of the Lord. Now these clay pots, the message that it brought, must have probably shook the people a little bit. The elders, the leaders. It was graphic, and you hear, imagine you're, you're overlooking this horrible place, just a garbage dump, this, the worms and the fire and the smoke and the garbage that's all there, and then you have this beautiful vase, and, and he says, look, this is what God's going to do, and you look at it, and he breaks it, right, and this is what God, this is, this is the future here, right here. This is your future. If you keep direction, you're heading out, this is where you're going. They didn't like it. It shook them. Exactly what it was intended to do, and Pashur who was the, uh, the official who kept order, who was in charge of keeping order in the temple, pretended to be a prophet. He always had his message of peace. When he hears these words, he comes and he locks up Jeremiah. He puts him in stocks. Now, stocks is a piece of wood with holes in them. You put your feet, maybe a single plank of wood, you have holds for your feet, you have holds for your hands, and sometimes for your neck also. And it's a very uncomfortable position to be in. It causes cramps, it causes pain. And it says he, he puts them at the Benjamin gate, probably a bit higher up in the open for everyone to see. 
So he captures him and he puts Jeremiah the prophet in stocks. In a public place. People walk by mocking Jeremiah. Look, Jeremiah, where are all your prophecies? Now you're here stuck in these stocks. He's there. He's in pain. And it says here that he struck him. Um, verse 2, then Pashur struck Jeremiah the prophet. Now that's not just one little hit or a little slap on the cheek. That could refer to the 40 minus 1 stripes that were prescribed in the Old Testament in the book of uh, Judges. Uh, or or uh, um, God gave it in the law to Moses. He was, he was beaten. 39 lashes, just like Jesus was beaten. So it wasn't just a little, you know, little strike in the cheek. It was, this guy was whipped mercilessly. When we are persecuted, I think that is when the truth comes out, what we're made of. And the question is, also when the message goes out like it did to Pashur, do you receive the message or do you become hardened by the message? That's why Jesus in Nazareth, he didn't preach the gospel very much. He didn't do any miracles in his hometown. Because the people had already made up their mind not to believe in Jesus. We know who this Jesus is. I mean, he was born by this Mary and who knows where he came from and he grew up in this common town, Nazareth, <clears throat> and he is a Messiah, forget it. We're not going to believe in him. He already, they already made up their mind. And so Jesus did not do many miracles because for him to do miracles, it would just harden them more. The clay pot would just become even more brittle. So Jesus was merciful and didn't do miracles. How do you respond to a message that is convicting? For Pashur, he put Jeremiah in stocks. I don't like this message. Let's quiet this guy. Just like in the New Testament, when the disciples were preaching, it says they brought them into the temple courts and said, you cannot preach in Jesus' name anymore. And they flogged him, beat him, hoping to quiet them. That's exactly what they did with Jeremiah. It's in interesting that Jeremiah endured similar sufferings as our Savior. Both were persecuted from religious people. Religious quarters, we could say. Both were scourged. Both were mocked. And both were put, we could say, on a pole to some degree, right? Jesus was crucified on a, on a tree. Jeremiah was put in stocks on a pole. So... Both were designed to humiliate them and to break them. Now, Jesus did not cave under pressure. Neither did Jeremiah. Now, one would think that after spending some time being flogged like that and uh, spending maybe a day and a night in stocks, Jeremiah might have said, okay, <clears throat> maybe I'll be a bit more softer. I'll be more careful with my words next time. The, the object lesson, I'll be a little bit kinder in the way I present it. Well, look in verse 3. And it happened on the next day that Peshur brought Jeremiah out of the stocks. Then Jeremiah said to him, The Lord has not called your name Peshur, but Magar Mishabib. <laughs> Jeremiah is just emboldened by the persecution. And he has a prophecy for Peshur. And he gives him a new name. He says, your old name, Peshur, means freedom. It means peacefulness or tranquility. But, he says, God has now given you a new name, Magar Misabib. It means terror on every side. That's your new name. You will be a terror not just to yourself, but even to your friends. Verse 4. For thus says the Lord, behold, I will make you a terror to yourself and to all your friends, and they shall fall by the sword of their enemies, and your eyes shall see it. I will give all Judah into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall carry them captive to Babylon and slay them with the sword. 
Moreover, I will deliver all the wealth of the city and all its produce and all its precious things, all the treasuries of the kings of Judah, I will give into the hand of the, their enemies who will plunder them and seize them and carry them to Babylon. And you, Peshur, and all you who dwell in your house shall go into captivity. You shall go to Babylon, and there you shall die and be buried there, and you and all your friends to whom you have prophesied lies. Wow, that's a pretty hard message. This is what's going to happen to you, for sure. You're going to be taken captive. You're going to die. You're always saying peace, peace, when there is no peace. The truth is you're going north, for sure, and you're going to die. Now, this all happened in 586 B.C., and then it happened again 11 years later where people were taken captive and carried off by Nebuchadnezzar to Babylon. Now, a bold message, right? Solid message. Powerful message. But you know, Jeremiah was human. Remember Elijah? When he slew 800 prophets of Baal? Man, Elijah, this man it was just strong for God and was willing to smite all these prophets of Baal, this boldness in this man. But then what happened to Elijah? He ran the next day. And he became so depressed that he pleaded God to kill him. Jeremiah is affected too. Yes, he is bold. But yet when he comes before God and he's alone, you see a very different Jeremiah. Look in verse 7. O oh Lord, you induced me and I was persuaded. You are stronger than I and have prevailed. I am in derision daily. Everyone mocks me. See, this is how Jeremiah feels. He feels used by God. The word that he uses here, you, were, you induced me, it, it, it's a sexual connotation. It's kind of like a guy who seduces a woman, and then he uses her, and then he throws her aside. That's how I feel. That's what Jeremiah said. That is how I feel. You lured me in to be this prophet. You seduced me. And I responded. And now you've thrown me aside. I don't see that Jeremiah is disrespectful with God, but he's very open. He's very candid with how he feels. Verse 8. For when I spoke, I cried out. I shouted violence and plunder because the word of the Lord was made to me a reproach and a derision daily. In other words, I have become a household joke. And I said, I will not make mention of him. In other words, I'm just going to resign now, nor speak anymore in his name. But his word was in my heart like a fire, a burning fire shot up in my bones, and I was weary of holding it back, and I could not. So much for resigning <laughs> for poor Jeremiah. Couldn't do it. When he tried to shut up, he said, I'm just going to stop preaching. Forget it. Everybody's laughing. I'm a household joke. Let's just be quiet. And he couldn't. He just, he just, he had a message. There, there's a saying that there's two types of pastors or two types of preachers. Those who have to say something and those who have something to say. Jeremiah was one that had something to say. He had a message from God to give to the people. What I observe is that Jeremiah was in doubt. There was fear in his heart, even though he was bold, but yet we see the tenderness of, of the Jeremiah. But he, he kept that to himself. He kept it between him and God. We see the same with David. When it comes to his fears, his inner fears that he was really experiencing, he was responsible with that. He brought it personally to the Lord. And I think it's the same in our lives. Sometimes maybe you have certain doubts, feelings that you, that you feel that it's best to just leave them between you and God. We have to be careful. The Bible says in Proverbs that we should put a, a watch before our mouth. Sometimes we need to be careful when we have feelings and 
they're, they they're may not be real. They're a little bit exaggerated because we're going through an experience. Sometimes, yes, it's good to share it with a, with a friend. Sometimes it's just bring it to God. That's where it belongs and leave it there. Verse 10, for I heard many mockings. Fear on every side. Report, they say, and I, we will report it. All my acquaintance watch for my stumbling, saying perhaps he can be induced. Then we will prevail against him, and we will take our revenge on him. His own people are plotting against Jeremiah, much like Judas. It was his own Judas Iscariot that he had walked with for three years that plotted against Jesus. The same for Jeremiah. See, when we serve the Lord, the Bible has promised that we will pro pro suffer persecution. See, don't expect hell to give you a standing ovation. Oh, you're serving God. This is wonderful. No. Hell is going to come against you. And you will suffer persecution in one way or another. But the Bible has promised that if we make our life count for God, we are a vessel that is pliable and shapeable. We are someone that carries the new wine, that there will be some opposition. Satan will have a way, one way or another, to bring opposition in our direction. Verse 11, but there's some hope. In the midst of all his despair, there is hope, but the Lord is with me as a mighty, awesome one. Therefore, my persecutors will stumble and will not prevail. They will be greatly ashamed, <clears throat> for they will not prosper. Their everlasting confusion will never be forgotten. So we see these extreme mood swings in Jeremiah from just defeat to hope in the Lord. And then he's really angry in verse 12. He's praying, God, revenge on these people. Verse 12, but O Lord of hosts, you who test righteous and see the mind and heart, let me see your revenge on them. So we see his emotions, his raw emotions as he serves God. I don't think that God desires to serve him, us to serve him just as robots. No, God has given us feelings. He's given us emotions. And that's fine. It's good. Um, but we need to be responsible in how we handle these emotions and these uh, feelings that we have. And we can always, there's one place we're always safe, and that is with God. He handles that. He, he's made us. He knows how we feel. And you can bring it to God, and he can sort it out for you. Verse chapter 21 Jeremiah now pronounces judgment on the last king of Judah. Now, Jeremiah 20 um, is written, let's put it this way. Jerem the book of Jeremiah is not written in chronological order. Chapter 20 ends with the son of Josiah, um, Jehoiakim on the throne, who reigned for 11 years. And now in chapter 21, takes a leap forward about 20 years. So chapter 20 and chapter 21, there's a 20 years gap. It's kind of like the old record player. Remember you guys? Remember that old record player with this big disc? We had one when I was a kid. And you had this music. You had this arm that you would move up on this disc, and it would play the music. And then it hits a rough spot, and it jumps, and it goes to the next song, or you know, it jumps over. Now this record really has a rough spot, and it jumps 20 years ahead. And that is where we are now in chapter 21. And chapter 21, picture the scene. Babylon is now surrounded around the city. They have now come to invade the city. That's where we are in chapter 21. And Jeremiah has a message. Now, if you want to show a, a slide that I had, uh, you can... Just uh, because there's some names here, and I don't want to confuse you, because if you just read through it, you're like, ah, it doesn't make a lot of sense. You have Josiah, who was a good king, right? He was a godly king. He became a king at age eight, and he became, he was a godly king. He, and he brought great reform. The land changed. And then his son, Jehoahaz, followed next. He was, Josiah was killed because he went and fought with Pharaoh as he went to fight the Syrian king and he meddled with 
something he shouldn't have meddled with, and he was killed around 30-some years of age. And the people mourned, and they put his son Jehoahaz on the throne. And he only reigned for three months and ten days, and Pharaoh from Egypt came and deposed of him, took him to Egypt, and he died there. And he put his son Jeho uh, Jehoiakim on the throne. And then uh, he was on the throne for a while, and then the Jehoiachin, and eventually Zedekiah. Now, Jehoiachin, the second last one, he is also Jeconiah. Sometimes in the Bible, he's referred to as Jeconiah and sometimes as Kuniah. So this guy is a little bit confusing. Uh, the second last one. Um, that's the guy that God curses. And he says, you will have no children. And that presents a problem. How can the Messiah be born if he's cursed? So that's, that's the cursed guy over there. Maybe we can just leave it on this for a little bit as we go through. So <clears throat> chapter um, 21 is 20 years ahead. So 17 years before that, 17 years before, Jehoiakim was reigning. You see the third guy. And Nebuchadnezzar came and took some people captive. He took the brightest and the smartest people with. He took Daniel with him. And he took Daniel's three friends with him. That's the third guy there. Uh, so Babylon didn't fall just in one, one, in one, eva uh, one uh, invasion. It was several stages how, how Israel fell, or how Jerusalem fell. So first, 17 years before chapter 21, there was already one invasion. Daniel was taken captive under Jehoiakim. And then 10 years before chapter 21, Jehoiachin was reigning, and Nebuchadnezzar came, and he took all the treasuries of the temple with him. He took him, and he took Jehoiachin, and he disposed him, uh, got, got rid of him. And then the last king, Zedekiah is on the throne. And that is where chapter 21 is now. Chapter 21 is the last king, Zedekiah. And then chapter 22, he's going to prophesy a little bit about the, f the first three kings. Uh, so it's a little bit, can be a little bit confusing, but with the names there, maybe you will follow. Chapter 21, verse 1 and 2, it says, The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah from the Lord where, when Zedekiah went to him. Pashur, the son of Micaiah, the son of Sephaniah, the son of Messiah, the priest, saying, Please inquire of the Lord for us, for Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, makes war against us. Perhaps the Lord will deal with us according to all his wonderful works, that the king may go away from us. Zedekiah is concerned. He's wondering what's going to happen. Let's go to the prophet and see what will happen. Let's see what type of word he has for us. And we'll have to leave it there this morning. Uh, and we'll come back next week and we will finish the, well, if we were going to finish chapter 21, 22 this morning, we'll just have to do it next time. We're, we're running out of time. We're having communion today, so we're going to just conclude the message. But suffering is what Jeremiah endured as he preached the gospel to these kings that were so opposed to God. It's incredible that they were Christian kings, yet they were opposed to God. It's, 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 it's crazy, isn't it? But isn't it exactly how religious settings oftentimes are? That they begin so well, but eventually they turn from God to a point where it's just a rigid rules and regulations, and when Jesus comes in, they have no room for him. Just like Jesus when he was there in Bethlehem. They didn't have room for Mary and, and Joseph as they wanted to have their baby. There was no room for him. There was no room for Jesus, we could say. Is there room for us? Is there room for you? Are you dedicated to serve God even in the midst of persecution? I found a, a poem, and I'm going to read it to you, by it was written by Amy Carmichael. She was a missionary in India and uh, started an orphanage. And this is what she wrote. And she wrote this about, about suffering. She wrote this about scars and wounds for God. This is what she says. Hast thou no scar, no hidden scar on foot or side or hand? I hear thee sung as mighty in the land. I hear them hail thy bright ascendant star. Hast thou no scar? Hast thou no wound? Yet I was wounded 
by the archers spent. Lean me against a tree to die and rent. By ravening beasts that compassed me, I swooned. Hast thou no wound? No wound, no scar? Yet as the maker shall the servant be, and pierced are the feet that follow me, but thine are whole? Can he have followed far who has no wound nor scar? I think that's a, a good question. Can he have followed far who has no wound or scar? There will be opposition. When we are a fresh flask, a moldable vessel in the hands of God, there will be persecution in our life. And that is to be expected, but it should not be, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't fear it. We shouldn't be afraid. Because when we serve God with a full heart, it will just embolden us. It will make us more powerful rather than weaker. This morning we want to remember what God has done for us on the cross. That he died for us and then he rose again, which is really the hope, which is really the center of Christianity. It's the cross. Because that is where forgiveness comes from. That is where you and I can be cleansed and forgiven. And that is where you and I can receive life eternal. It is at the cross and it is at the tomb, the empty tomb today, that Jesus is no longer there. He's risen. He's the only religious figure, if you want to call it that, whose tomb is empty. All the other religious figure, figures like Allah and, and uh, Buddha and all these other, they, ha they have a grave, they have a place. This is where they're buried. But Jesus' tomb is empty. Because he rose again so that we might have life. So I'll ask the uh, ushers to come up and we will uh, hand out the communion. I'll ask uh, the worship team to come up and uh, we'll, we'll do a song as, as they hand out the, the elements.